Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our Sunday School class on the Chronicles of Narnia. This morning, we're going to be looking at the topic of the sun, soul. We'll be exploring the solar connections in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. So I think this is the first week that I'm actually presenting uh, one of Michael Ward's chapters on the planets, uh, because previously we had Morgan cover the chapter on Jupiter as it relates to the line of the Witch in the Wardrobe, and then Pete covered the chapter on Mars as it relates to Prince Caspian. So I'll be covering Soul as it relates to the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. So this is our uh, seventh lesson in the series. So we're going in publication order rather than chronological order. All the C.S. Lewis scholars say that's the way you got to go. Uh, so that's how we're doing it. So we will begin, as I usually begin, with some trivia questions. But I'm going to warn you, uh, since we already did trivia questions from last week, I had to dig a little bit deeper into my repertoire of Don Treader trivia. So these ones are a little bit more difficult. We'll see if y'all can handle them. Here they are. And you really need to know Don Treader to be able to answer most of these. So I'm going to give you a minute, take a look at these questions, and then we will try to answer them together. Should we look at them together? Yeah. Let's do it. Number one, what are the names of Eustace's parents? Alberta is the mom. Very good. Harold, did, did you say it? Yeah. Very good. Harold and Alberta are Eustace's parents. Number two, who is Caspian's regent in Care Paravel during the voyage? Trumpkin. Trumpkin. Very good. I heard a few people say that. Number three, what does Eustace eat after he is turned into a dragon? Another dragon. You may recall he, he witnesses a, 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 an old dragon drinking some water, and then it just falls over dead. And then he goes into the dragon's cave and finds the bracelet, puts it on, falls asleep, and wakes up as a dragon. So the first thing he eats is the dead dragon, and he felt awful about doing it too. Number four, what is the only object the crew takes from Burnt Island? This is a tough one. So, Burnt Island is probably the most forgettable of all the islands. It's only mentioned in like two pages, right after they leave Dragon Island. And all they find there are some goats and like some burned out huts. But there's one object that they decide to take from the island. And that is it. Very good, Annie. It is Reaper Cheap's Coracle. It's too small for the, the crew members, but it's just the right size for a mouse. So Reepicheep takes the coracle from Burnt Island, and that is the coracle that he uses to paddle into Aslan's country at the end of the novel. Okay, um, number five. Why does Aslan rebuke Lucy in Coriakin's house? Yes, very good. So she, she, she does an eavesdropping spell to listen to her friend Marjorie Preston. If I remember the name correctly. And she overhears Marjorie saying some bad things about Lucy. Aslan rebukes her because she was never supposed to hear that conversation because Marjorie didn't really mean what she was saying. She was just trying to impress the other girl she was in a conversation with. So that is why she got rebuked. Number six, how does the food on Aslan's table get replenished? Birds. So every morning the birds come and they, and they, they clear out the uneaten food. And then in the evening they come back and, and replenish it with new food. And they do that every day. Uh, number seven, how many of Caspian's crew stay behind on Romandu's island rather than continuing to the world's end? Just one. And if you really know your Don Treader trivia, you'll know his name. Pit and Cream. Pit and Cream. Nobody would know that. Um, but uh, so the story of Pit and Cream is he regretted his decision to stay behind on the island because it was just him and Romandu and Romandu's daughter, and it was boring and rainy. And then after the crew came back to pick him up, he felt excluded, so he deserted them once they made it back to the Lone Islands. And then he made his way down to uh, Kalormine and spent the rest of his life there, bragging about how he had made it to the end of the world when he really didn't. Um, so that's what we learned about Pit and Cream. Number eight, what is the name of the sea at the world's end? I think we mentioned this last week. The Silver Sea. Very good. Very good. And then number nine, what are the sea people doing when Lucy first sees them? They're like hawking, they're underwater hawking though. So yeah, it's a hunting party. Um, all right. And then number 10, who eventually becomes Caspian's wife? Ramandu's daughter. Very good. And so not to give away too many spoilers, but she's killed at the beginning of the silver chair. And John Hodges will be covering the silver chair next week. So sorry, I might have just stolen one of your trivia questions for next week. <laughs> okay, so uh, this morning, 
We're going to wrap up some of the key themes, uh, one of the key themes that I didn't have time to cover last week. So you may recall, I'm highlighting four key themes from the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Uh, The longing for heaven, the old self, nothing buttery, and enlightenment. It just so happens that this turns out to form the acronym L-O-N-E, and their first destination in the Dawn Treader is the Lone Islands, which you see here on the map. So today, I'm going to wrap up the key themes with enlightenment, and then we're going to move into Michael Ward's argument for the solar elements in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. So let's talk about enlightenment and what the Voyage of the Dawn Treader has to teach us about that. You may recall the scene on Dark Island. You guys remember what happens to people when they get caught on Dark Island? Their dreams come true, but not their happy dreams, their scariest dreams, their worst nightmares come true on Dark Island. So that's where they pick up Lord Roop, one of the great lords of the Telmar, and uh, they're trying to escape the island, but they find themselves going around in circles, and they don't know if they can get out, and it's just pitch black, utter darkness. But then Lucy prays, And then there is a small speck of light that appears. There was a tiny speck of light ahead, and while they watched, a broad beam of light fell from it upon the ship. It did not alter the surrounding darkness, but the whole ship was lit up as if by a searchlight. Lucy looked along the beam and presently saw something in it. Notice that expression there. Lucy looked along the beam. Does that sound familiar to you? Where does that come from? Meditation in a tool shed. Do you remember how Lewis talked about there are two ways of of looking? You can look at the beam or you can look along the beam. Do you remember the difference between those two perspectives? So he's talking about, you know, his encounter of walking into a dark tool shed and the only thing he can see is a beam of light. It's a shaft of light coming through one of the windows. And he can look at the beam and he sees like, you know, the dust particles within the beam. But what happens when he steps into the beam and looks along it, out, out the window? He can see the sun beyond. He can see a tree with the branches and leaves. He can see birds and so forth. It's two radically different perspectives, which correspond to two different ways of knowing. According to Lewis, what were those two ways of knowing? Do you remember? Contemplation and enjoyment. So contemplation is looking at the beam. Enjoyment is looking along the beam. And according to Michael Ward, and probably Lewis himself, the purpose of the Chronicles of Narnia is to invite us to look along the beam, to sort of step into the world of Christianity, to step into the gospel and and observe it from the inside experientially. And so that language that Lewis is using here for Lucy is deliberate. Just as Lucy is looking along the beam, we're invited to look along the beam as we read the Chronicles. So she looked along the beam. At first, the light looked like a cross. Then it looked like an aeroplane. Then it looked like a kite. And at last, with a whirring of wings, it was right, uh, right overhead and was an albatross. Who knows what an albatross is? It's a really big seabird, right? It has a massive wingspan. That's a picture of an albatross. And that does raise a good question. Of all the birds, of all the objects that Lewis could have picked, Aslan appears as an albatross here. Why? What's the significance of an albatross? Yes, so that it could signify that land is nearby. Yes, but they're trying to get away from the land in this case, right? Because Dark Island is the bad place. There is actually important literary symbolism behind the albatross. Who knows what other literary works reference Old Man in the Sea? I was not aware of that one, but I'll take your word for it. That's the one I was thinking of, Gene. Yes, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which was written by who? You really know your literature if if you can answer this. Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, So I read The Rime of the Ancient Mariner in preparation for this lesson. It's kind of weird. If you've ever read it before, I mean, you have like these zombie sailors possessed by angels, and it's like, (laughs) so he finds himself stranded at sea after killing an albatross. Let me explain it, okay? Because here's the reason why uh, Lewis chose to depict Aslan as an albatross. And of course, Lewis, being an expert in English literature, was very familiar with this. He cites Coleridge regularly in his writings. Uh, And so um, here's an excerpt from that poem, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner by Coleridge from the year 1798. 
Now, what the, the context for the poem is there's a, a mariner who's retelling the story of, of, of a, a voyage to a particular wedding guest, and he's actually holding up the wedding guest from attending the wedding, but he feels obligated to tell this story of this voyage of his from the past. And he talks about how uh, his crew, their ship, they sailed down towards Antarctica, and they got trapped in the ice. And what happened while they were trapped in the ice? At length did cross an albatross. Through the fog it came. As if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit. The helmsman steered us through, and a good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow, and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. So the albatross is intended to be a symbol of blessing, of good favor. And so when the albatross arrives, they're able to break their way through the ice, and they're able to sail back northward. And for a time, briefly, the albatross is following them. But then what happens to the albatross? I just said so. The mariner shoots the albatross, kills it. I think with a crossbow. And at first, you know, the crew is very alarmed that he's done this because that was their good luck. But then they're, they're, they're able to sail further north and think, okay, maybe it was fine that, that that happened, no big deal. But then they get stranded in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and there is no wind. They are stuck in the middle of nowhere and they realize the, their guilt, that they should not have killed this um, creature made by God. And so as punishment they make the mariner wear the albatross around his neck. Have you ever heard that expression before, like an albatross around your neck? So it's, it's a, a reminder of your guilt that hinders your progress or success. That's sort of what the expression refers to. And so um, it does not have a happy ending. He's the sole survivor. Anyway, I don't want to spoil too much of the, of the poem for you if you want to go read it. Um, so... Uh, anyway, you see here a depiction of the Mariner as a statue. This, I think, is in like Somerset County in southwest England in a harbor town there. So watch it. I think that's the name of the town. Uh, anyway, this was in the back of Lewis's mind when he's depicting, de depicting Aslan as an albatross because the albatross is meant to be a symbol of spiritual blessing, even a symbol of Christ, the one who is killed by his own people um, for, for no just cause. And so... Um, that is why Lewis is depicting Aslan uh, as an albatross. And here's the lesson that we can learn about the hope of enlightenment. Um, this comes from Bruner and Ware's book, Finding God in the Land of Narnia. Here's the lesson they teach us about enlightenment. The message is as heartening as it is simple. When in darkness, breathe out a prayer for help. The light that comes in answer, be it ever so small, will always be enough to dispel the deepest shadows. For at the heart of that narrow beam burns an unmistakable image of hope, the sign of the deliverer rising in the form of the cross. And here's how Joe Rigney um, draws the lesson from it. Aslan is the light, and his light is the light of men shining in the darkness, unable to be overcome. Like Jesus, he is the light of the world. And in another beautiful twist from the writings of the Apostle John, he is the Lamb of God. How does Aslan appear at the end of the story? As a lamb who takes away the sins of the world, the Lion of Judah who scatters light from his mane, the one who answers Edmund's question about whether he is in our world too with the simple phrase, I am, a reference to the burning bush. So there, there's some important lessons to draw from that story of Aslan rescuing them as a beam of light, an albatross from Dark Island. But now we come to the argument from Michael Ward, his chapter on soul, and how does that relate to our interpretation of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. So you may recall, here is my chart to summarize Michael Ward's argument. So if you're new to us this morning, here's the basic thesis that is presented by C.S. Lewis scholar Michael Ward in his book, Planet Narnia, which was published first back in 2008. He believes that Lewis, although he never told anyone this explicitly because he wasn't intending to, um, he designed each book within the Chronicles of Narnia to correspond to one of the seven medieval planets. And there's a certain symbolism associated with each planet. There's a certain god associated with each planet. And that symbolism and the characteristics of that deity are expressed in the way Lewis wrote these books within the Chronicles of Narnia. So the line, the witch, and the wardrobe corresponds to Jupiter. Prince Caspian corresponds to Mars. 
The voyage of the dawn treader corresponds to the god Sol. Now, question for you Greek mythology experts. If Sol is the Roman name of the god, what Greek god corresponds to the sun most closely? I heard it. Oh, yeah. Apollo. Very good. There are, you're going to hear a couple references to Apollo in the lesson this morning, so just keep that in mind. Apollo, as I recall, was the son of Jupiter. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there, there are some interesting connections there between the sun and Jupiter. But the qualities of the sun would be wisdom, liberality, generosity, freedom, and enlightenment. The metal associated with the sun is gold. And what characteristic of Christ is displayed? Uh, light. Those are the themes we'll be looking at as we look at these solar connections in the voyage of the Dawn Treader. Uh, to understand where Lewis is getting this symbolism from, one of the greatest works from the Middle Ages that shows us the symbolism of the medieval planets is Dante's Paradiso. You may recall last week I made a reference to um, Dante's Inferno and the story of uh, Ulysses voyaging to the end of the world, but for the wrong motives and and his voyage ended with a storm and him drowning with his crewmen. Uh, but in Paradiso, we see Dante being guided by Beatrice, the most beautiful woman he's ever known um, in his mortal life. And he's ascending through the spheres of heaven all the way up to the highest heaven. And I believe the sun is the fourth sphere. And according to Dante, this is the sphere of theologians and philosophers. So when they arrive in the fourth sphere, the sphere of the sun... Dante and Beatrice encounter Albertus Magnus and uh, Thomas Aquinas. They're the two men at the top, as well as uh, a number of other wise men, philosophers, so including like King Solomon, um, Bede, Gratian, who was a, a great legal theorist from the classical period, uh, and Boethius, um, who I'm going to mention later on. Boethius was one of the best-known philosophers of the early Middle Ages who wrote a book called The Constellation of Philosophy. I'll mention that in a few minutes. But the symbolism behind soul um, is, is very much on display in Dante's Paradiso. This would be a great supplement to read as you read through the Chronicles of Narnia because all of the planetary symbolism that Ward highlights, you can also see it in Dante's Paradiso as Dante ascends through the spheres of the heavens. Um, but to give you um, some background information on how does Lewis understand the medieval symbolism of the planets, there are two sources, aside from the Chronicles of Narnia, that I'm going to draw your attention to. This is going to give us a framework for understanding what Lewis is trying to do in the Chronicles of Narnia. One of those sources I'm going to highlight is The Discarded Image, which was Lewis's final book, published posthumously a year after he died, which is really an explanation and a, and a defense of the medieval worldview. And there's a chapter in there that he devotes to talking about the medieval understanding of the heavens. And here's uh, what Lewis has to say about soul in that chapter. Soul is the point at which the concordat, the agreement between the mythical and the astrological, nearly breaks down. Why is that? Because within the mythical system, remember, Apollo is, is the son of Zeus, so he's intended to be subordinate to, to Zeus. But there's a sense in which the sun is greater than the planet Jupiter, right? So how do those harmonize? Well, not so easily. There is some complicating factors there. Mythically, Jupiter is the king, but Sol produces the noblest metal, gold. You remember what metal was produced by Jupiter? Tin. Not so special in comparison, right? Um, especially in the age of canning. So, uh, uh, soul produces the noblest metal, gold, and is the eye and mind of the whole universe. He makes men wise and liberal, and his sphere is the heaven of theologians and, and philosophers, as I mentioned with Dante's Paradiso. Soul produces fortunate events. So, this is Lewis's summary of the symbolism of the sun, according to the medieval worldview. The other source from Lewis that I'm going to highlight is a, uh, a poem that he wrote earlier in his career called The Planets, where he poetically describes each planet according to its medieval symbolism. And here's what Lewis has to say about um, the sun, which is the sphere right above Venus. Far beyond her, Venus, the heaven's highway hums and trembles, drums and dindles to the driven thunder of soul's chariot. That just sounds wonderful in English, doesn't it? You hear the alliteration there and the, and the rhyme? Soul's chariot, whose sword of light hurts and humbles, beheld only of eagle's eye. 
When his arrow glances through mortal mind, mists are parted, and mild as morning, the mellow wisdom breathes o'er the breast, broadening eastward, clear and cloudless. In a closed garden, unbound her burden, his beams foster soul in secret, where the soil puts forth paradisal palm, and pure fountains turn and retemper, touching coolly the uncomely common to cordial gold, whose ore also in earth's matrix is print and pressure of his proud signet on the wax of the world. He is the worshipped male, the earth's husband, all beholding archchemic eye. There's a whole lot in there, and it would take quite a while to unpack all of the meanings within this poem here regarding the sun, but I'm just going to highlight a few phrases for us um, for our purposes this morning. So keep these two sources in mind, the discarded image and the planets. These are going to be helpful resources for us as we look at each book within the Chronicles of Narnia, because the symbolism of the planets is on display very overtly uh, in contemplative mode in these sources, as opposed to the enjoyment mode that we find in the Chronicles themselves. Here's what Ward has to say about the solar symbolism in The Voids of the Dawn Treader. Now keep in mind, Not every C.S. Lewis scholar is on board with Michael Ward's thesis. The planet Narnia thesis that each book corresponds to one of the medieval planets, many Lewis scholars are very much enthusiastically on board with this argument. Um, But others, not so much. My personal conviction is, yeah, I do think it really does work, and I'm hoping to convince you of that through the course of this class. But it's a little bit more overt in some books than in others. Uh, So, like, for example, Prince Caspian, The Connection to Mars, yeah, I, I think it's there. Um, the connection between the horse and his boy and Mercury, mm, yeah, maybe. Um, the magician's nephew and Venus, yeah, maybe. But the voids of the Don Treader, it is right there in your face. It is on the nose. It is the most explicit planetary connection of all the books. If every book was as obvious in its connections to the medieval planet as this one, nobody would doubt Michael Ward's thesis. It is very obvious. Here's what Ward has to say. In The Voids of the Dawn Treader, the solar influence governing the story could be divined from the title alone, The Dawn Treader, for this is a tale about a journey toward the rising sun. As is the case in most of the other books, the prevailing planetary spirit becomes progressively more intense as the story proceeds. But only in this story is the planet actually located and identified as the destination of the plot, the very eastern end of the world, the utter east. Reepicheep, whose literal orientation helps motivate the quest. Do you remember what is Reepicheep's ambition in the voyage? He's, he's not interested in rescuing the Telmarine lords. That's, that is the official you know, purpose of the voyage. He wants to go to Aslan's country or die trying. So Reepicheep swears he will sink with his nose to the sunrise if it is the last thing he does, which indeed it turns out to be, as Sol, in one of his guises, that of Apollo Smintheus, Apollo the mouse catcher plays his part. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? One of Apollo's titles is Apollo the mouse catcher. So I don't think it was just a coincidence that Lewis chose to have Reepicheep's ambition to be to journey to the sun. I'm going to highlight four solar themes that Ward identifies in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Those four themes are brightness, gold, wisdom, and liberality. And if you look at our sources, you know, the discarded image and his poem on the planets, those are some of the expressions that correspond to each of those themes. So brightness corresponds to beheld only of eagle's eye, meaning you can't stare directly at the sun unless you have the eyes of an eagle. Gold, which is the noblest metal produced by the sun. Wisdom, meaning that, you know, the sun, the the, the fourth sphere of heaven is the heaven of philosophers and theologians. And liberality, Um, Lewis says that the sun makes men liberal, and we'll talk about what that means as well. But we'll begin with brightness. Uh, Towards the end of the book, you may notice that once they reach the Silver Sea, Reepicheep falls overboard. And after they rescue him, what does Reepicheep tell them about the water? It's it's sweet, right? It's drinkable water. Not only is it drinkable, but it has this rejuvenating power. It makes you feel stronger than you've ever felt before, healthier than you've ever felt before. And so they all drank it. But presently, they began to notice another result. As I've said before, there had, been mu- there had been too much light ever since they left the island of Romandu. The sun too large, though not too hot. The sea too bright, the air too shining. 
Now the light grew no less. If anything, it increased, but they could bear it. They could look straight up at the sun without blinking. They could see more light than they had ever seen before. And in the next chapter, Lewis refers to it as eagle's eyes. So very explicitly connecting it to his previous descriptions of the solar symbolism. And so here we see on display Lewis's um, emphasis on brightness, which is woven into the plot of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And that's not the only way we see this theme of brightness displayed. According to Ward, brightness is adroitly handled, chiefly by the device of contrasting the increasing light with occasional plunges into darkness. The storm in chapter 5, the nighttime salvation of Eustace in chapter 7, the dark island of chapter 12, the overnight vigil in chapter 13 punctuate the, gl the glowing brilliance so that the final three chapters of uninterrupted light do not feel de trop, which is French for too much but rather the deserved reward of dedicated seekers after luminosity. Now, I, I should highlight, um, when we look at all these connections, brightness and gold and so forth, you might be wondering, well, what's the point of all these connections? I think the best answer, the answer Lewis would want us to, to give is, well, the connections are the point, right? That we are invited to look at these themes to enjoy them. We're not meant to analyze them or dissect them or draw practical lessons from them, although I think we can do that. But that step should come afterwards, right? This is meant to create an atmosphere for us. It's the dawnigality of each book, if you remember us using that term. And so it's meant to draw us in to immerse ourselves into a particular flavor, an environment, an atmosphere. But there is a lesson, I think, that we can learn from this brightness. Notice what Scripture itself says about the character of God. You can't look directly at God, can you? Because what happens if you try to look at God face to face? What, what did God say to Moses? In Exodus chapter 33, God says to him, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. But then that principle uh, takes a twist in the New Testament. Notice the conversation that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4 when they're talking about the water of the well. And Jesus says, There's another water that I'm offering you. And whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Just like how in the voyage of the Don Treader, what happened when they drank the water of the Silver Sea? It gave them the power to stare directly at the sun. And what happens to us if we drink of the water that Christ offers us? We will be able to behold God face to face. Look at what 1 John 3, 2 says. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And as Jesus says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Apart from Christ, if we were to stare at God, it would destroy us. But through Christ, by partaking of the water that he offers us, we can actually behold God face to face and fulfill our deepest longing. So I think there is a Christological connection that we can draw from this theme of brightness. And it reminded me of this hymn. You guys remember the hymn, Jesus, I am resting, resting? I love the RUF version of that. Uh, is it Matt Smith who sings that version? I think it is. But um, the final verse of that hymn, notice um, how, the, how the hymn goes. Ever lift thy face upon me as I work and wait for thee. Resting neath thy smile, Lord Jesus, earth's dark shadows flee. Brightness of my Father's glory, sunshine of my Father's face. Keep me ever trusting, resting. Fill me with thy grace. Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory. He is the sunshine of our Father's face. So I think that is a lesson that we can draw from the Voyage of the Dawn Treader as it puts on display this theme of brightness. Theme number two, gold. Now, I think this is most obviously on display when they go to Death Water Island. You may recall what happens is um, they come to this pool, this lake, that turns everything in it into gold. Anything that touches the water gets turned into gold. And what metal does the sun produce, according to the medieval worldview? Gold. So it's quite clearly on display here. Edmund says, after, um, after he encounters the water, he warns everyone else, back away from the water, don't touch the water, he says. That water turns things into gold. It turned the spear into gold. That's why it got so heavy, and it was just lapping against my feet. It's a good thing I wasn't barefoot, and it turned the toe caps into gold. And that poor fellow on the bottom, well, you see. Does anybody know who was the poor fellow at the bottom of the lake? It's one of the Telmarine lords. It's Restamar. 
rest MR, resting in the sea, I think. So, yeah, he, uh, he could not restrain himself. He was overcome by the greed. And so that is one of the, um, the dangers implicit in, in the gold produced by the sun. It, it can foster a spirit of greed. And we actually see that spirit overtake Caspian and Edmund because immediately after this, they begin fighting over who has the right to claim this island. Um, and um, it, it takes a very nasty turn when they're almost about to come to blows with each other. But then what stops them? They catch a glimpse of Aslan on the ridge above them, walking past them, and they immediately realize how foolish they had been. And then they, they leave. And that's why Caspian decides to name this island Deathwater Island as opposed to Goldwater Island. Here's what Ward has to say about the theme of gold within the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. The engoldening influence of soul is evident in other places too, not just at Deathwater Island. The ship's flag bears the picture of a golden lion. And inside the stern cabin, there is a flat gold image of Aslan. In the other chronicles, Aslan's image on shields and banners is usually jovial red. So red's the color associated with Jupiter. But in this story, the special power of solar alchemy means it is only ever gold. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? Every time Aslan is depicted elsewhere on banners and flags and so forth, he's red. But here in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, he's gold. I'm pretty sure that is deliberate on Lewis's part. I think that's one of his ways of weaving in these solar themes into the narrative. And then point number three. I'm going to come back to gold momentarily because it's going to connect to theme number four. But theme number three is wisdom. Um, trivia question for you. What English word etymologically means the love of wisdom? Philosophy, right? And again, remember that the sun, the sphere of the sun, is the heaven of the philosophers, and I think there's, a, there's an interesting part of the story where we see this theme of wisdom and philosophy expressed in the book. It's right after Eustace is turned into a dragon. The, the crew, they come to see that he really is remorseful, not only for having become a dragon, but for the way he's treated everyone as well. And Reepicheep, who is no fan of Eustace at this point, because remember, like, Eustace tried, like, spinning him around by his tail. And so Reepicheep intended to avenge his honor in a duel, and they had to calm him down. But here's, here's how the story goes in the conversation between Eustace and Reepicheep um, after Eustace has been turned into a dragon. He would explain that what had happened, so talking about Reepicheep here, would explain that what had happened was a striking illustration of the turn of fortune's wheel. And that if he had Eustace at his own house in Narnia, he could show him more than a hundred examples of emperors, kings, dukes, knights, poets, lovers, astronomers, philosophers, and magicians who had fallen from prosperity into the most distressing circumstances and of whom many had recovered and lived happily ever afterwards. So he's trying to give a consolation to Eustace here. Something that's noteworthy about this little paragraph here, it's the only time in all the Chronicles of Narnia that those two expressions are used, fortune's wheel and philosophers. You don't actually find the word philosophy anywhere else in the Chronicles of Narnia, except here where Reepicheep is trying to console Eustace after having turned into a dragon. Now, you may or may not know this, but the Wheel of Fortune is not just a game show. It was a common medieval expression, and who knows what work is most famously known for expressing the concept of the Wheel of Fortune? Very good, The Consolation of Philosophy, written by who? Boethius, and you may recall, he is one of the philosophers who is in the fourth sphere of the sun, according to Dante's Paradiso. That is a brilliant work, by the way. I just read it for the first time, like, last year. Not connected to this class, but um, uh, anyway, yeah, I'm planning to assign it for my students at Westminster Academy. The story of Boethius, I, I love Boethius. I mean, not only was he a brilliant thinker when it came to Christian theology, like, he, he developed one of the most important works on the Trinity in the Middle Ages, but also, he gave one of the best defenses of philosophy. So this work, which he wrote in the early 6th century, was when he was condemned, uh, exiled away from his home in Italy, uh, and not knowing it yet at the time, but he was awaiting his death, his execution, um, because it turned out that he was on the wrong side of a political rivalry um, in Italy. And so he is, he's overcome with depression. And this is true. This is really what happened to Boethius. But during his imprisonment, he decided to console himself by writing a work in defense of philosophy, demonstrating how can philosophy actually provide a comfort to us in any circumstances that we're facing. And so the, the book itself takes place as a dialogue between Boethius and Lady Philosophy, a, a personification of philosophy. And here's one um, 
statement made by Lady Wisdom to Boethius. You knew the mutability of fortune, and you should have inured yourself, that is, toughened yourself, uh, against her constant threats of betrayal that too often inspire fear and flattery from those she has momentarily graced. Would you presume to stop that wheel of hers from turning? If you could do that, it would no longer be the wheel of fortune, would it? So uh, the, Lady Philosophy discusses this at length in, um, in the Constellation of Philosophy. Side note, for a future Sunday school class, I'm, I'm intending to do an entire series on the topic of happiness. What is it that makes us truly happy? And I'm intending to go through the Constellation of Philosophy, but there's a couple other resources that I'm going to use as well. So there's a book called How and How Not to Be Happy by Jay Bujashevsky. That name is a mouthful, but he's a great contemporary philosopher. Um, there's another book that came out by Jonathan Haidt called The Happiness Hypothesis. I'm considering using that one as well. So stay tuned for that. We're going to have a lot more to say about Boethius at some point in the future. But I just wanted to draw your attention to this now because I think this, this notion of wisdom and philosophy is also woven into the plot of The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And that is a connection that anybody who knows Lewis and his scholarship knows the importance of Boethius to Lewis's thought. He's probably one of the top 10 most important influences on C.S. Lewis's thought. Um, in fact, he gets a whole section within the discarded image. Lewis is describing the importance of Boethius. So that's theme number three. And the final theme we're going to look at today is liberality. Now, I'm not talking about political liberalism here, so don't think like left-wing politics. But what does the word liberal mean? Free? Very good. What else might liberality mean other than freedom? Generosity. Absolutely. There's actually a number of things that liberality means. So you may recall that, that um, according to Lewis in the discarded image, soul makes men liberal and wise. We've already looked at wisdom, but let me explain liberality here. It means at least three things. Um, and this is, I, I'm getting this from Michael Ward again. It means generosity. It means disinterested. And it means freed from greed. Or another way of putting that is undragoned. And I want to try and explain each of these points one by one. So these are subpoints within our fourth theme. Generous. How do we see the principle of generosity displayed in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader? Well, here's what Ward says. Caspian provides ale for the old salts, rum for the ship's company after the fight with the sea serpent, grog all round following their escape from Dark Island. And he promises gold or land enough to make the sailors rich if they will accompany him to the utter east. More significantly... He helps bring the release of Pug's slaves on the Lone Islands. You may recall, that's the, the, the slave trader that kidnapped them. Uh, by offering a cask of wine to the slovenly guards at Narrowhaven. For giving Gumpus, the governor, his debt, and reimbursing Lord Byrne and the Calormine traders. Thus, generosity is put in the service of freedom. So this theme of generosity is clearly on display within the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Now, what do we mean by disinterested? Don't confuse it with uninterested, okay? Disinterested does not mean apathetic. So disinterested actually means you don't have an ulterior motive. You don't have a hidden agenda. You value something for its own sake, not for what you can get out of it. So it could be opposed to like a, a utilitarian or instrumentalist attitude, right? You only value something for what it gives you. And this, this disinterested conception of liberality is also clearly on display as they're about to enter into Dark Island. They're debating whether or not they should actually go uh, into Dark Island. Now, as we, we come to see, like, um, although it does allow them to rescue Lord Root from Dark Island, it turned out to be a place of peril. But they don't know that yet at the time. And so they're debating whether or not to enter into the, into the darkness, and uh, Drinian, who is the, the captain of the ship, he says, but what manner of use would it be plowing through that blackness? Use, replied Reepicheep. Use, captain? If by use you mean filling our bellies or our purses, I confess it will be no use at all. So far as I know, we did not set sail to look for things useful, but to seek honor and adventure. This is what I love about a liberal arts education as well, by the way. Because it's training students to, to love those things that are valuable for their own sakes. Truth, goodness, and beauty. These are the things that make life worthwhile. It's not necessarily going to give you a bigger paycheck in the end. It, I mean, it might help you with your career. But that's not the point of a liberal education. right? The point is to enrich your humanity. 
by teaching you to love things that are truly lovely. Uh, and, and Lewis has something similar to say in The Four Loves when he's describing the value of friendship. He acknowledges that there's, there's not much utilitarian value to friendship. I mean, yes, friends can be useful. According to Aristotle, that is one of the categories of friendship is the useful friend. But if that's the only thing you're trying to get out of a friendship is, is to use your friends, is that really a genuine friendship? No, genuine friendship is so much deeper and richer than that. Friendship is unnecessary like philosophy, like art, like the universe itself, for God did not need to create. It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things which give value to survival. It's one of my favorite lines from The Four Loves. That's another great book that we may have to look at in the future as well. But um, this is what we mean by disinterested. This is the principle of liberality on display, to love something for its own sake, to value it for its own sake. And finally, um, the third way of defining liberality uh, is to be freed from greed. Or another way to put it would be to be undragoned. You might notice that there are several dragons described throughout the voyage of the Dawn Treader. And again, this corresponds to the Greek god Apollo, because another title to Apollo was Apollo Soroctonus, which literally means Apollo the lizard slayer or the dragon slayer. And so we see this conflict between the sun and, and dragons, which is pretty much inevitable if you think about the symbolism. What's the metal produced by the sun? Gold. And what do dragons value more than anything else? Gold, right? They're greedy. They hoard their treasure. That's what they're known for. And so look at these different descriptions of dragons in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. First, we encounter the old dragon on Dragon Island. Remember, that's the dragon that Eustace ended up eating. It's not clear to us whether that was one of the Telmarine Lords or if that dragon had killed the Telmarine Lord there. But um, either way, uh, we see the death of that dragon. And then, of course, Eustace himself. We can refer to Eustace's conversion as a type of dragon slaying because he has to put to death the old self. And then there's the sea serpent after they leave Dragon Island. Remember, it coils itself around the ship, and they have to push it off of the ship before it destroys them and sinks them. But then I think the ship itself is also symbolic of a dragon because it's actually in the shape of a dragon. It's on the masthead. You know, it's the head of a dragon. But also there's a connection between the ship itself and the one leading the voyage, Caspian. I think there is a sense in which Caspian... Um, undergoes a character transformation through the book as he has to um, overcome his own dragonish impulses and temptations. We see that first on Deathwater Island. Remember, there's the conflict between Caspian and Edmund over who gets to claim this land, right? He's overcome with this spirit of greed, but then he's chastened when he witnesses Aslan walking along the ridge, and he recognizes that there's that greedy impulse within him that he needs to put to death, and then at the very end of the world, in the final chapter, you remember that there's a moment when Caspian, he, he, he's willing to give up his kingship in order to enter into Aslan's country himself? But what do all the crew say in response? No, we're not going to let you do this, bro. If you try to do this, we're going to mutiny. Because that's our duty. To honor you as king is to keep you in your place as king and ensure that you fulfill your duties as our king. And so... Uh, uh, at that point, Caspian has a moment of reluctance when Lucy reminds him, hey, by the way, you know, um, if you leave to Aslan country, Aslan's country, you're not going to get to see Ramondo's daughter again. And he's like, oh, that's a good point. I need to think about this. So he goes into his cabin, and then he has an, another encounter with Aslan where he has a vision of Aslan who rebukes him and reminds him of his duty. And that's when he decides, okay, it's not my time to enter into Aslan's country. So Reepicheep is the only crew member who, who does enter into Aslan's country. And that is what ends up breaking the spell on the sleeping Telmarine lords back on Ramandu, Ramandu's island. So we see this, the, this concept of overcoming dragonish impulses and slaying dragons is also woven into the storyline of the voyage of the Dawn Treader. And so here's how Ward wraps it up. The spiritual crisis brings the Soroctonus theme to an intense and unexpected but entirely appropriate climax, describing that final point where Caspian finally gives up the desire to enter into Aslan's country and abdicate the kingship. Aslan as soul burns away the dross in Caspian's motives. He makes the dragonish king and his dragonish ship subject to the spirit of gratuity. That is liberality. So these are the themes that we have highlighted in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I hope this makes your reading of the books so much richer. 
I hope it allows you to dive more deeply into the themes that Lewis has actually put on display for us and allows you to enjoy the books that much more, even as we contemplate the, the meaning of, and significance and application of these themes to our lives. Next week, we're going to hear a lesson on the silver chair taught by Mr. John Hodges. So I'm going to be really looking forward to that lesson, so I'd encourage you to come back to hear that next week. But before I let you all go, do you have any final questions or comments for me? All right. Well, can I close this in prayer, and then we can get ready for corporate worship? Heavenly Father, I, I thank you that you have illuminated us, you have enlightened us, you have drawn us by your Holy Spirit, and you have put to death the sinful impulses within us, and that sin no longer has dominion over our lives. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to equip us by your Holy Spirit to fight against the selfish temptations, the dragonish influences in our own lives. I do pray, Lord, that you would fill us with the spirit of wisdom and liberality, to value those things that truly are lovely, to live up to the design for humanity that you have intended. We do pray, Lord, that you would continue to forgive us of our sins and our faults and to aspire to holiness, to be more like your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone.